All right, what is happening, everybody? I got a couple more great little forgotten folk tales to tell you about today. This time about life on the high seas. But before I tell you those stories, I gotta introduce you to a couple of relics of seafaring history. This guy and this guy. On my left, we got an example of a ship's medicine chest. And over here, we got the accompanying instruction manual or symptom book that goes along with the chest. For decades, this little pairing was, you know, like the bread and butter of medicine at sea. We got the chest full of all sorts of different tonics, medicines, drugs, and then the book right there to explain how and when to properly use them. If you got sick on a boat back in say like 1850 or something like that, there's a pretty good chance that somebody was about to crack open the old book and chest to try to nurse you back to health. Now I should be clear before we go any further, you know, medicine chests, they were never exclusively a boat thing. Like plenty of, <laughs> of land lovers had these things in their homes too. Like just look at some of these ads I found for home medicine chests. These are all from newspapers. Pretty cool, right? Like here's a good one from an 1898 New Jersey newspaper. That's supposed to be like a small little medicine chest that you strap onto a bicycle. And hey, here's a really cool one. Wisconsin, 1897. Look at that dignified woman there preparing an elixir from her chest. But those, uh, those home chests, that's not what I wanna talk about today. What we're gonna focus on is the books and chests that you could find on ships specifically, because those things, they were a big part of sailing back in the day. Like all sorts of references to them are splashed through the pages of maritime history. You know, we got, we got newspaper listings from port cities talking about how the local pharmacy would refill and inspect medicine chests for a small fee. We got tonics or miracle pills advertising themselves as the entirety of a ship's medicine chest condensed down into one simple supplement. And hey, if you pop open the right literary classic, you might even see someone like uh, Charles Dickens or Paul Heise talking chests. Like these things were so common and considered so important that in 1872, the US Congress even passed a law requiring their presence on certain sea voyages. Hey, eventually we even got government symptom books published by the US Public Health Service too. And let me tell you, <laughs> looking through all these symptom books from back in the day, it's a real treat. Like I was able to dig up a whole bunch of them and there's just, there's all sorts of these great little tidbits tucked away in their pages. So sit on down, get yourself a drink and let me uh, leaf you through a couple of 19th century symptom books and show you some cool stuff. So one of the first things that you gotta know here is that these books and chests, they weren't always necessarily set up to be used by like professional experienced doctors because not all ships had professional experienced doctors. You know, if you were on like a, a small boat, maybe like 20 people or so, doctoring might just be the job of the captain or some other person on the boat with only limited medical knowledge. So the symptom books, they had to be written in a way that a layman could understand, you know, clear, simple instructions without a whole bunch of super dense terminology. And one of the most common ways that these books and medicine chests were simplified was with a numbering system. See, if you pop open the right medicine chest from back in the day, you might notice that pretty much like every herb or drug or tonic or whatever in there, it's got a number assigned to it. Like, you know, maybe this bottle, that's number one. That bottle, number two. Number eight, number 14, that's bottle number 26, 35, 43, like you get it, right? Then if you open up the symptom book that went with the medicine chest, you would learn what all those numbers meant. Like for example, here's a symptom book from 1884. And in the medicine chest that went with this symptom book, bottle number one, that was sulfur. Number six, that was flaxseed. Number 18, peppermint, so on and so forth. Oh, and hey, sometimes there would even be like these pre-mixed elixirs included in the numbering system. Like for example, all of this mixed together might be in bottle number 10, for instance. It's right there, it's ready to go. Don't gotta do any prep work. So as I'm sure you can guess, the whole point of this system was really just to kind of simplify picking the right medicine out of the chest. Like let's say you got some sailor, right? With basically no medical training. And one of his crewmates is suffering from a super like bad burn. And the patient is in a ton of pain and he's screaming and yelling. And he's waving his arms all around. And our makeshift doctor is there and he's flipping through the symptom book and he's rummaging around in the medicine chest and he's freaking out, doesn't know what he's doing. He's trying to read all these tiny labels on all the bottles. Is it gonna be easier for that guy to find a bottle marked carbolized oil mixture or a bottle that just says eight? 
So it's a pretty smart system, right? Oh, and uh, by the way, that little paragraph there on how to treat burns, that's a great example of what makes up the bulk of these symptom books. Like almost all of them are full of stuff like this primarily. You know, it's just sort of like a, a description of an injury or a disease and then instructions on how you handle it. And <laughs> they got like instructions for everything in there, like sunstroke, scurvy, lockjaw, a dislocated so shoulder, broken arm, scarlet fever, even even stuff like nosebleeds, right? Oh, and uh, and sometimes the books will include like these little drawings too. and. <laughs> Some of those are just gold. Like, uh, here's one of my favorites. This is from a 1904 guide. It's showing how to how you should try to push the water out of a drowning victim's lungs. But <laughs> doesn't it just kind of look like a like a pleasant lakeside massage? Like the guy's just kind of dangling his arm in the cool water. He's laying on his other arm. He's relaxing, and somebody's just doing a little work on his back, right? And here's another couple good ones. Uh, got a couple guys here that are all nicely bandaged up after some jaw injuries. And uh, here's a drawing of a lancet knife that would be used for bloodletting. Yeah, uh, some of these uh, symptom books were written far back enough that bloodletting was still a thing. And, oh, and if you don't know what bloodletting is, it's basically just like this super old and very misguided treatment that doctors used to do back in the day where they would intentionally drain a whole bunch of blood from your body. And there was like all sorts of justifications for why they thought this was a good idea, but today the process has been pretty much totally phased out in modern medicine. You know, depleting a patient's blood supply is just gonna hurt them in most cases, obviously. But at the time that these books were written, some of them at least, it was still considered genuine medical treatment. So you get great little entries like this one I found in 1887. So you're trying to revive someone who is just hung by the neck, are ya? Well, first thing you gotta do is uh, take that noose off him. Then you gotta lay the body somewhere where the guy can get some air in his lungs. And then you gotta pop open a vein and get some of that pesky blood out of him. He doesn't need all that. And hey, that should do it. It'll be good as new in no time. Oh, and uh, and by the way, you know what kind of accident or disease requires the most significant bloodletting, according to one of these books? Falling down. Yeah, that's right. You, you slip getting out of bed or something and you bump your head. Time to let some blood out. Captain, Captain, Johnson just fell down the stairs. Go get the knife. All right, so now I wanna show you what is probably my very favorite thing that I found in one of these symptom books. So I got this out of a, an old book from 1847 that I found. And one day I was just sort of like flipping through the pages, you know, leafing through the passages. And I was reading the section on dysentery and I noticed that the passage recommended using <laughs> a very strange sounding medicine on the patient. Something literally called toast water. Now, I don't know about you, but I never heard of anything ever called toast water before. But luckily for me, this particular book, it's actually got like, you know, a list of recipes for the medicines that it prescribes. And look at that, they got one on toast water. So let's check out this recipe real quick, huh? First, you take some bread and then you toast the bread and then you put the toast in water and that's the end of the recipe. <laughs> that's literally it. Like you just, it literally is just toast water. You make toast, you put it in water and you got toast water. Oh, and I actually did a little bit of digging on toast water and from what I can tell, it was like at least a semi fairly common thing back in the 19th century. It seems like they thought it was sort of like a, like a substitute for solid food if somebody was having trouble eating. I mean, at least I think that's what it was supposed to be, but I'm not exactly sure. Like a lot of the accounts that I found just kind of mention it offhand, like, oh yeah, that guy's drinking toast water, no big deal. Oh, and uh, uh, before we move on, one more thing. This is pretty crazy. I actually found an article from an 1843 newspaper talking about how a guy in New York tried to murder his wife by putting opium in her toast water. Is that not the most like, <laughs> the most 1843 news story you've ever heard in your life? Like, can you even imagine if that story came out today? Like if you flipped on the local news channel and they were talking about attempted opium poisoning via toast water. Oh, oh, oh and by the way, uh, apparently the woman who was drinking the, the tainted water, she noticed like a bitter taste from the opium, but she just kind of like shrugged her shoulders and guessed that whoever made the water must have just burned the toast a little too much. <laughs> but all right, we're getting like way off track here. 
you know, I could sit here all day and tell you about all the weird stuff I found in these books, like the female pills or, or the treatise on the teeth, but I think it's about time that we settle down and I tell you a couple of classic forgotten folk tales regarding medicine chests and symptom books. Because as you know by now, these things were important parts of sailing life and culture. And so unsurprisingly, there's, there's no shortage of folklore surrounding them. So let me tell you a couple of quick stories. All right, so uh, this first one I pulled out of a Virginia newspaper from 1909. And it's sort of like this interview with a, an old salty sea captain who says that his medicine chest only ever included two items, castor oil and something called whippecac. <laughs> and if you were sick below the belt, you got castor oil. And if you're sick above the belt, you get whippecac. So broken toe, castor oil. Headache, whippecac. Foot fungus, that's castor oil. But an ear infection, it's whippecac time. Oh, and uh, by the way, I got absolutely no idea what Whippecac is. I couldn't find a single other reference to it anywhere, like at all. Like not even, not even an offhand mention in some other book or an old newspaper or whatever. My best guess though is I did find that there was, you know, a fairly common old medicine called Ipecac. And so maybe I'm thinking that this captain is sort of like trying to make a pun here by turning Ipecac into Whippecac. Like maybe it's his, sort of like jokey way of saying that he's gonna literally whip you if you get sick. Like, oh what, you're sick? You want some Ipecac? Well, how about some Whippecac, you cry baby? Oh what, you got a sore throat? You want a cough drop? Well, how about a cough drop kick? All right, on to our next story. So this one's from a Vermont newspaper from 1902, and it's talking about a ship doctor who really was not well liked by his ship's crew, mostly because he really only ever prescribed one kind of medicine, no matter the sickness, whether you got a, a headache or an earache, a fever, a bruise, sprain, scrape, whatever. That doctor is gonna tell you to sit down and take a little seawater. Like no matter what you got, he's curing it with salt water. So you can see why the crew really wouldn't like him very much, right? Cause he's making them knock back tablespoon after tablespoon of, of ocean as a cure to an upset stomach. And as the story goes, one day our doctor, he's got a stroke of real bad luck and uh oh, he falls overboard into the ocean. And it's real stormy out there and the doctor's getting blown all around and he just barely scrapes by with his life. So afterward, he goes to talk to the captain about his near death experience and the captain, he just doesn't really seem all that concerned. He just listens to the doctor's story and then shrugs his shoulders and says, well, I'm glad you're all right, but I don't think you're ever in any real danger. I mean, would it really be possible for you to drown in your own medicine chest? <laughs> and all right, let me close this out with one last story, probably my favorite one. This little yarn comes to us from a book called The Nantucket Scrap Basket. It's just like this, uh, like a little collection of folk tales that the author heard from people out on Nantucket Island in Massachusetts. And one of the stories in there is called The Captain's Prescription. And it tells the story of a captain who is frantically trying to help someone who has come down with some kind of horrible illness on his boat. So the captain, he's there and he's flipping through his symptom book, right? And he identifies the problem. And he reads that he needs to give the patient a dose from bottle number 11. Yeah, remember that numbering system we talked about earlier? So the captain, he pops open the medicine chest and he digs around and he finds bottle number 11 and uh-oh, it's empty. So the captain thinks for a minute. He's in a real pickle now. He mulls it over and then he realizes something. He grabs bottle number five and he grabs bottle number six and he mixes them together and hands that over to the patient. Cause six plus five equals 11, right? So there you go, problem solved. <laughs> and hey, according to the story, the patient, he actually eventually pulled through too. So good thinking of that captain. Oh, and hey, uh, by the way, that sailor, he should actually consider himself lucky pulling through like that. Cause, cause I've heard tell of another story where a captain needed to give a guy some of bottle number 15 so he gave the dude a little of bottle number seven and a little of bottle number eight, you know, cause seven plus eight equals 15. And wouldn't you know it, the guy was dead in 15 minutes. Ah, <laughs> oh, thanks for watching. See you guys next time.